Hi there and welcome again to the Explaining History podcast. And in this episode, uh, there is um, a book that I've been enjoying for some time now and it's a real, really exciting to actually be able to talk about this uh, and to, to explore this writing with you. I, I've been hoping to look at uh, Mike Davis for some time. Um, to those who aren't aware of his work um, I'm looking at Set the Night on Fire LA in the 60s by Mike Davis and John Weiner Um, Mike Davis particularly uh, recently uh, deceased unfortunately um, was one of the the kind of great radical urban geographers um, and uh, of of, uh, kind of modern uh, in in, in our sort of modern uh, academic um, era um, who um, looked at uh, basically class struggle um, particularly as it pertained to LA and California um, and the the kind of the the urban environments that emerge as a result of that and the overall thesis of this book is that the radicalism of the 1960s was by and large the product of grassroots movements and uh, working class, uh, often non-white working class organisation and struggle, and the the people who have most to um, uh, have, have most kind of claim to having brought about radical change have obviously have subsequently been largely airbrushed out, out of the the narrative um, the uh, picture that we uh, gain from the 1960s is one of a kind of a white middle class activism by and large with a, a few exceptions such as obviously kind of Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement but um, the point that is made in this book is that the civil rights movement itself the black civil rights movement was far more uh, Um, in Los Angeles centred around working class resistance but that's what we're going to look at now so this um, part of the uh, uh, book we're going to explore the origins of the freedom rights uh, and the commission on racial equality Uh, so Mike Davis and John Wayne are right in April 1947 Shortly after the Supreme Court outlawed segregated seating on interstate bus routes, 16 members of the, on the Congress of Racial Equality and its, uh, and its mother organisation, the Radical Pacifist Fellowship of Reconciliation, boarded buses to test the implementation of the ruling in the Upper South. CORE had been started in 1942, the brainchild of James Farmer, a charismatic black uh, FOR uh, organiser from East Texas. With a handful of others, he proposed planting the seeds of a freedom movement that would employ non-violent direct action uh, against segregation and inequality. Although the philosophy of core was Gandhian, Satyagraha, and its methodology, sit-ins, jail-ins, wade-ins, boycotts, derived as much from the international workers of the world and the CIO as it did from the Indian freedom movement. The primary organiser in nineteen forty seven of the nineteen forty seven project was Bayard Rustin, um, then an assistant for the FOR executive director AJ Must, a living legend of the American left. Splitting into two teams to test both greyhounds and trailways, the core riders avoided major violence, but twelve were arrested for defying, um, defying the back of the bus rule. They called it a journey of reconciliation. Fourteen years later, Farmer revived the tactic, naming it the Freedom Ride. In 1960, the 1961 Freedom Rides relentlessly tested the metal of civil rights activists against mob violence, police brutality, and the federal government unwilling to enforce federal laws. They also transformed CORE from a tiny pacifist sect into a major actor in the civil rights movement, the only one organised to launch direct action campaigns in both the North and the South. SNCC and SCLC, of course, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, were regional cadres, while the NAACP, with notable local exceptions, the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People, was primarily committed to political lobbying and judicial activism. 
The rides, of course, were more than just the riders. They centrally involved black campuses and communities in almost every southern state, as well as tens of thousands of active supporters north of the Mason-Dixon line, who marched in support um, in, uh, in support demonstrations, organised hundreds of meetings, and raised funds to meet the extortionate bail set by segregationist judges. They also constituted the reservoir of volunteers to keep the rides on the road. Los Angeles ranked second among cause fodder cities in the north. New York was the first, sending five separate contingents of freedom riders southwards in the summer of 1961. These 49 volunteers, 26 black, 23 white, were vital reinforcements who braced the movement after the battlefield moved from Alabama to Mississippi, where the segregationist officialdom tried to destroy it with mass arrests, nearly 300 of them, and imprisonment under appalling conditions. Corps' chapters in Southern California shared this aura of courage, and for the next two and a half years became the spearhead of a protest movement that culminated in the United Civil Rights Committee's campaign of 1963. A Los Angeles Corps chapter, the first on the West Coast, was founded soon after the end of the Second World War by black draft resistor Manuel Tilly, and Manuel Tally, a big one, um, and a few other pacifists. Tally was ta a talented organiser and forceful speaker, but also a polarising personality. Although the group won some victories against discrimination rest uh, restaurants, discriminatory restaurants, the pro and the anti Tally faction soon split into separate chapters. Moreover, L.A. Corps, which adopted an anti-communist membership clause in 1948, was completely overshadowed in the early Cold War period by the, activists of black pro the activities of black progressives around the Communist Party and the CIO. So just to take a pause there from um, the writing of Davis and Weiner, um, I think it's important to look at uh, within uh, you know, emancipatory movements, the polarizing role of, of kind of personalities um, uh, and, and leaders who inevitably have the detractors, who inevitably uh, present kind of um, uh, uh, ideas and programs that won't uh, uh, appeal to everybody. And the fact that in 1948, CORE itself had an anti communist, um, uh, an anti communist clause suggests one of an, a number of things. Firstly, uh, either uh, core members were not fooled by the um, the kind of the false progressivism uh, of the uh, Communist Party of the USA um, and could see it for the for the the kind of the Stalinist organisation that it was, or more likely. The um, the blank the, the sort of that the almost hegemonic um, anti-communism that shaped post-war America affected um, even uh, radical uh, civil rights organisations. The extent to which civil rights organisations were um, looking to do more than simply. Uh, establish um, uh, political rights um, and the extent to which civil rights organisations wanted um, to adopt a more uh, overtly socialist ideas it is a kind of a matter of, of debate obviously you mean King by the, the uh, uh, Martin Luther King Jr by the end of the 1960s was uh, beginning to articulate explicitly socialist ideas but for the most part, didn't really think of himself as socialist. Um, and obviously, as you, there are um, uh, explicitly socialist ideas in the, the Black Power movement and the uh, organisations like the Black Panthers. And um, gradually, as as you you get to those, the 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 later nineteen sixties, you start to see this. Um, uh, analysis of um, uh, black oppression in America coming from uh, coming from the left being uh, kind of widely uh, embraced uh, as a kind of an, uh, an explanation of um, slavery and segregation 
as being essential to the the workings of different faces of capitalism but obviously in in 1948 it, it doesn't appear that those ideas have really found a kind of um, a, a fertile ground in which to, to plant themselves. Um, though they were sometimes, you know, they were often articulated by um, the, the, the kind of the advocates of, of Soviet communism. So uh, we hear now more about uh, Manuel Talley uh, and uh, Davis and Weiner Wright. The, the National Office thought Talley's skills might be better applied as a Western field organiser and indeed he found several, founded several new chapters before another feud led to his resignation. In any event, Talley was frustrated by Corps lack of impact in the black community and he created as an alternative the National Consumers Mobilisation to boycott products and firms associated with discrimination. He wrote, Martin, he wrote to Martin Luther King, for example, to offer support for the Montgomery bus boycott by organising a parallel movement in Los Angeles Transit Lines, a subsidiary of the National City Lines, which owned the Montgomery system. King undoubtedly sensed that his correspondent was a, um, a general without an army, and he politely declined Talley's offer. In 1962, Talley regained activist stature in LA as, uh, as a leader of the Citizens Committee on Police Brutality, and later as LA's core spokesperson on the same issue. Los Angeles Corps was briefly revived in the mid-1950s when two experienced activists, Henry Hodge from St. Louis and Herbert Kalman from Baltimore, both moved to the area. After a few arrests, the group successfully integrated Union Station's coffee shop and barbershop. But a campaign to pressure the major downtown department stores to hire blacks in non-menial positions quickly ran out of steam, leaving a demoralised residue of 10 or 12 members. So evidently that there were, there were easy targets and more complicated ones. There were places of, um, for, where there was the opportunity for um, advancement of the civil rights cause, and then there were sites where, uh, the, where integration was, was much, more, much more challenging, much more difficult. But the Southern sit-ins gave the chapter a powerful shot of adrenaline, Corps Field Secretary James McCain visited LA in March 1960 to rally troops for the Woolworths protests and assess the potential of the local chapter. In addition to the independent student union people, some of whom believed the Freedom Riders and Corps activists, um, some of whom became Freedom Riders and Corps activists, what the, um, the Woolworths campaign energised civil rights supporters at UCLA where Robert Singleton, a black's economic major, led the campus NAACP group, later to become the Santa Monica Corps chapter, and Stephen McNicholas led Platform, a student political party similar to Slate in Berkeley. For several years, they had been organising protests against racial exclusion in the Westwood student housing. Other members of the Proto Corps group included Robert Farrell, a Navy midshipman and a future member of the LA City Council, Ronald Labostri and Rick Tuttle, a future UCLA administrator and city controller, and Santa Monica College, Singleton's wife, uh, and at Santa Monica College, Singleton's wife, Helen. Like so many other black uh, Angelinos, Farrell and Labostri had Louisiana roots, and they belonged to, the, uh, to Catholics United for Racial Equality. Uh, a citywide group struggling uphill against the reactionary policies of Cardinal James McIntyre. So this this is really interesting, and if you tend to look at civil rights as you know, undoubtedly uh, a, a great a, a great many people do through the prism of uh, Martin Luther King, obviously um, the, a, a pivotal figure in the civil rights struggle, and it, it becomes very easy to ignore this vast and complex movement. Um, that had uh, shifting priorities, um, loyalties, feuds, divisions, um, that sometimes uh, was successful, sometimes had uh, failures, um, 
and that it was far more complicated than the the kind of the very sort of textbook picture uh, that we, we we tend to have um, uh, represents to us. Um, this this kind of re re complicating of history. This this this, this kind of re enriching of of the historical narrative, which you know, film and television really does boil down to its most kind of re reductive elements, I think is really, really important. I think it's really, really uh, valuable to to look at the workings of grassroots movements. Just as we kind of um, look at the, the functioning of the, uh, the everyday, um, when we take our various forays on this podcast into examining the Soviet Union, Looking at the the, the, the functioning of of um, of, of s uh, small, regular, consistent, grassroots organising and acting and 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 activism, starts to give you a much bigger picture as to how change occurred. Well, that's what we're chiefly interested in. So, we continue. After Kennedy's inauguration in January 1961, the Southern Movement began to lose national attention. In March, uh, Martin Luther King, not invited to a meeting at the Justice Department that included other civil rights leaders, asked the White House for an appointment, but the new president had no time to see him. Confronted with an ex escalating crisis in Berlin and the final preparations for the CIA invasion of Cuba, the administration regarded civil rights as an annoyance rather than a priority. Here's the bit where we kind of have to contend with some of the, the sort of naive, liberal, um, make-believe about John F. Kennedy, uh, this kind of Cold War hawk who, for the most part, um, did as uh, as little as possible for the the civil rights movement, um, despite kind of all that is is said about this kind of useful and dynamic figure in the White House. Um, you know, obviously a, a presidency brutally cut short, but one whose uh, achievements are are highly questionable. Um. James Farmer, newly appointed National Director of Corps, agreed with King and the SCLC that the Kennedys had to be prevented from sweeping their civil rights election promises under the carpet of continual Cold War crises. He proposed a freedom ride um, through the Deep South to test a recent Supreme Court decision that extended non-discrimination in interstate travel on trains, buses and airplanes to include terminals and waiting rooms as well. In a situation where the law was now crystal clear, but its application was bound to elicit violent reactions in hardcore segregationist states, Farmer calculated that Washington would be forced to act. The ride would help sustain the energy of the student movement while redirecting it to a higher level of contestation uh, involving, uh, involving governors and federal officials as well as mayors and local businesses. Everything, however, depended on the volunteers' willingness to risk their lives by riding into the heart of segregationist darkness. So this is really um, uh, the kind of the crux of the matter with the, um, with the freedom rides. It was about looking to see if the federal government uh, was willing to actually enforce the law that the Supreme Court had um, established, uh, well, not not established, but the 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 the, the, um, the Supreme Court had laid down in its interpretation uh, of uh, of the wording of the Constitution. Um, the um, this is why the stakes are so high, and this is why it becomes so dangerous for the freedom riders. Uh, the 13 riders, led by James Farmer, left Washington on, uh, on May the 4th in two groups, one on trailways and the other on Greyhound, just as in 1947. Unlike the journey of reconciliation, however, which ventured no further south than North Carolina, the tickets were stamped New Orleans via the Klan strongholds of Alabama and Mississippi. 
outside of Anniston, Alabama, the Grey bus, uh, the Greyhound bus, its tires slashed, was forced off the road and then firebombed uh, by pursuing Klansmen. According to Raymond Arsenault's history, several members of the mob had pressed against the door, scre- uh, screaming, "Burn them alive and fry the goddamn niggers!" And the Freedom Riders had been all but doomed until an exploding fuel tank convinced the mob that the whole bus was about to explode. As the attackers retreated, the passengers crawled out of the bus, only to be attacked with pipes and clubs. And I apologise for the use of offensive language, but, you know, this is uh, uh, part of a, a historical a historical account, so uh, uh, there you go. Meanwhile, the trailways contingent also badly beaten in Anniston, found themselves heading towards Birmingham with some Klansmen as fellow passengers. In Alabama's largest city, the police commissioner, Eugene Bull Connor, met with the Klan to choreograph a welcome for the Freedom Riders. He gave Imperial Wizard Bobby Shelton and his, um, and his carefully selected thugs 15 minutes to set an example that would deter all future attempts at integration. Through a Klan informant, the FBI knew all about Connor's sinister plan, but it made no effort to warn Kaur or any of the local civil rights leadership, nor did J. Edgar Hoover bother to inform anyone in the Justice Department. The massacre that followed on Mother's Day 1961 was such an enthusiastic affair that Klansmen armed with lead pipes and baseball bats hospitalised not only the riders, but also news reporters, black bystanders, and mistakenly even one of their own number. President Kennedy, a cold warrior first and foremost, was reportedly furious at James Farmer, not Bull Connor, or Alabama Governor John Patterson for embarrassing the administration on the eve of his Vienna summit with Khrushchev. Can't you get your goddamn friends off those buses, he shouted uh, at the White House civil rights advisor. Stop them. Um, again, this gives us a, a, some some interesting snapshots on, on the, the kind of the, the uh, Kennedy's uh, overall outlook and his perspective and his priorities. Huddled together at the parsonage of Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, the embattled headquarters of the Birmingham Freedom Movement, the core group vowed not to surrender and instead went downtown to catch the next greyhound to Montgomery. But Governor Patterson stopped the departure, going on television to warn that he was unable to protect the Freedom Riders from the Klan ambushes along the route. Bobby Kennedy finally convinced the group to fly to New Orleans, but the air, uh, but um, but they ended up spending the night on a plane at the Birmingham airport as one anonymous bomb threat after another was called in. Connor and his clan allies gloated over their victory. It was a miracle that several of the volunteers hadn't been burned or beaten to death. Farmer, for who many of the in the NAACP regard, uh, regarded as irresponsible for concocting what Roy Wilkins had called a joy ride, now waved. Uh, wavered in the face of near certainty that any attempt to resume the ride to, from Birmingham would be a virtual death sentence for the participants. But Diane Nash, the key strategist for the Nashville sit-in movement and co-founder of the SNCC, urged him not to lose nerve and capitulate to white violence now that the very premises and premise of non-violent social change was at stake. Student reinforcements, she assured Farmer, were coming from Nashville under the leadership of John Lewis uh, and were ready to sacrifice their lives if necessary. Although the first attempt to board the buses in Birmingham was thwarted when Connor jailed and then deported them across the state line to Tennessee, the kamikaze contingent soon regrouped and clandestinely returned to Birmingham. One of their members was 20-year-old Susan Herman, a white exchange student at Fisk University in Nashville from Whittier College. Her family lived in Mar Vista, just east of Venice Beach. After much arm wrestling between the Alabama officials and the Justice Department, they were allowed to board a Greyhound for Montgomery, the state capital. There another ambush awaited, with the Klan again uh, given 10 minutes of police non-interference to commit maximum mayhem. And Bobby Kennedy's representative at the scene, Assistant General, uh, Attorney General John uh, Seigenthaler, attempted to rescue Herman and another young woman from the mob. He was beaten unconscious with a pipe. In an escalation that took Washington by surprise, the city and the state police then allowed several thousand whites to besiege the injured Freedom Riders and their local supporters in the sanctuary of Ralph Abernathy's First Baptist Church. <laughs> 
hastily cobbled together task force of federal marshals uh, sent to protect the church was attacked and came close to being overrun. This is the point at which the uh, Washington starts to have second thoughts. Uh, before Governor Patterson, aware that the army was um, uh, on alert at Fort Benning, finally sent in the troopers to quell the mob. He had cut a cynical deal with the Justice Department. The bus carrying the Corps and SNCC volunteers would be escorted safely through Alabama and handed over to the Mississippi State Police. The riders were unaware that Kennedy had also promised not to interfere with Mississippi authorities as long as they prevented white violence. Thus, upon arrival in Jackson, the Nashville contingent was arrested and then imprisoned after refused, refusing bail. This became routine for the rest of the summer, a grim endurance contest between waves of arriving freedom riders and their Mississippi jailers. So, the, there's a kind of an interesting uh, story there, um, in as much as the the changes that we see in, in the 1960s um, the particularly in, in the field of black civil rights nothing is given nothing is given at all nothing is given from on high power uh, concedes nothing unless it absolutely has to the um, role of the federal government is at least under the Kennedy years an entirely reluctant one We'll look at Johnson another time. Um, and I don't, uh, and there, that has its own complexities. But Kennedy had nothing but reluctance and um, uh, a, a sort of resentment, if you will, at being forced to um, divest kind of mental and political capital in the civil rights movement, of which he had had precious little interest. Uh, other than some campaign pledges um, and the importance of um, working class organising um, really it gets overlooked um, and we, we look at perhaps excessively the, um, the kind of the, the, the titanic figures of the civil rights struggle to the exclusion of the, the everyday people that put their uh, their lives on the line, or at the very least their lives on hold for years as they participated in um, organising. Anyway, I hope you found this uh, a useful and interesting podcast, and uh, I'll be back uh, next week with, um, I think we will look at the uh, expansion of Germany's war into the Balkans next week. So I can't promise I might change my mind. Um, anyway, thanks so much, and do check us out at explaininghistory.org, um, and uh, I'll uh, speak to you soon. All the best. Bye-bye.